If our kids come to school with smaller vocabularies, and children with smaller vocabularies acquire new words at a slower rate, how can we, the speech language pathologist or the teacher, play a role in effectively closing that gap? We need to pre-teach vocabulary. We need to give students exposure to new vocabulary words before asking students to use them. We need to select words that will support the reader's understanding of the text. Make sure that all the new word learning is connected to ensure that it actually helps them to access the learning of their classroom and is not so separate or at random that our students don't get to integrate it right away. We need to include those phrases and connectors that affect comprehension. I would encourage you, especially with some of your younger students, to think about those best practices of total physical response, for example, often referred to as TPR, which we, the research shows us is so highly effective for an English language learner. And, and think about role play or acting out. I can remember the time that I teach students, taught students about the word squished and had four students climb into a cardboard box together. They were able to use that word effectively very quickly as opposed to if we hadn't gotten into that box together. Use gestures. Show real objects. Additionally, you can use pictures, quick drawings, keep the whiteboard close by, or give the word in the child's first language and ask the student to provide um, in English. So, so really making connections for them. Perhaps showing them a picture, they may be able to very quickly tell you that word in L1 and now we can ensure that in that filing system of their brain that, that they're attaching those two words together. We want to make sure that definitions are also student friendly. So this will vary based on the age and the, the ability levels of the students that you're teaching. But we need to think about how can my student access this word. Use graphic organizers. Think about ways that students can attach a new word to a word that already exists in their lexicon. Uh, the example I often think of is a student of mine, she happened to be an English language learner and a student with an IEP, and she loved to use the word pretty. It was a sight word for her, she could spell it without having to pause, and so her stories read very formulaic. It was, mom is pretty, flowers are pretty, teacher is pretty, dog is pretty, and so I wanted to expand that vocabulary, but it was important to start with what she knew pretty, let that be the center of her graphic organizer, and branch out from there and talk about what are other words that could mean the same thing. And, and from there on, for the first few writing assignments, she referenced that graphic organizer, but quickly she had about five words that she could use in the same way. We want to give students opportunities to practice new words. Knowing a word means being able to define it, recognize when to use it, understand the multiple meanings of that word, both decode it and spell it, and use different definitions in different contexts. That's mastery. The only way to make sure students understand a new word is to have them produce it themselves. And that needs to be done in a very safe learning environment. So students are encouraged to make mistakes. I love when a student creates a word that doesn't exist in English, but they're demonstrating to me that they're trying. So perhaps they added a suffix that actually doesn't go on to that root word, but wow, were they really applying and demonstrating understanding. Let students play. Praise that exploration, and students will have much greater success in acquiring new words. Direct vocabulary instruction is effective. Teachers should introduce new words in the context of engaging texts. Design activities that allow learners to manipulate and analyze word meaning. And ensure repeated exposures to new words, noting how those meanings may vary as a function of the context. Teaching strategies for inferring the meaning is effective. 
if it's built on evidence-based procedures such as explicit teaching, using context clues, morphological analysis, cognates. It's so important that we really help our students to understand different types of academic language, content language, which is the teacher's domain and, and may be unique to each subject, metalinguistic language, figurative language, help our students to, to access and understand the distinctions. I, I use a visual with my students when I talk about metacognitive language so that they understand how important it is to think about what you're thinking. And so there's, there's thought bubbles appearing within their thought bubbles and, and making it accessible to them as fourth graders. Help them to know those terms to expect and to use in order to build on their metacognitive language, knowing very well that your fellow colleagues and, and standardized tests are going to, to have these demands on them to understand cause and effect or summarize, to compare and contrast, to sequence or predict. Let's not let those words be barriers to our students demonstrating what they know. This activity I just love. I want to end by sharing a few examples of vocabulary instruction that I have found to be highly effective with my students, all based in what the research shows us to be excellent vocabulary instruction. We decided to create a prefix suffix tree in our room. And I have to give full credit to these fifth graders pictured here because when I was talking to them about root words and prefixes and suffixes, it was actually their idea to create the tree. And so you see the very beginning of the tree here, but what was wonderful was each time we learned a new prefix or a suffix, we added a leaf. And they had the wonderful forethought to say, all the prefix leaves, they're gonna go on the left side of the tree because when they fall, they'll be in front of the roots. And all the suffixes, they're gonna go on the right side of the tree so when they fall, they come at the end. And my students took ownership of understanding these concepts in such a deep rooted way that no matter what was on that leaf, wow, did they want to experiment and create new words and so we exponentially expanded their vocabulary that year because they were able to make combinations. Each time they learned a new root, they could apply it to every prefix and suffix we had ever, ever learned and vice versa. Um, they also, just as a fun tip, um, in the same way that you think about around Valentine's Day, the easiest way to, to make a paper heart is to fold the paper and, and then cut. My students did the same with their leaves. So this actually became an interactive bulletin board, if you will, that far more students than the fifth graders I had intended it for started to access because each leaf opened up on that fold so that they saw the prefix or the suffix on the outside and then inside could understand what that prefix or suffix was going to do to the root word, change its meaning in some way. I also love using a semantic continuum, and this activity can be used with varying ages. You just need to make sure the words are appropriate for your students. So helping students to really organize words that may have related meanings, but at different degrees. Um, so for example here, to go from dry to drenched and start to figure out what other words they may want to add to see how those words relate. Again, when we teach these words together and help our students make those connections, it's so powerful to know that they're organizing right there those file folders in their brain. How easy it will be for them to then draw upon those words because they learn them in context of other words that may be related. For younger students, I find that sometimes to, to flip this activity um, to perhaps be a thermometer, and so they understand that the intensity of the word maybe gets higher as you go up the thermometer as, and sort of show the varying degrees. So there's a lot of fun ways to do a semantic continuum. 
I also love vocabulary cartoons and want to tell you about a great website where there's a lot of free vocabulary cartoons, vocabularycartoons.com, where they introduce a word with a fun visual. Uh, we don't show the actual visual here, but I encourage you to, to go to their website. So for example, the word panache, a dashing elegance of manner and style. And since there's a, a sound association with panache and mustache, vocabulary cartoons will create a great visual that really draws students in and creates a visual memory for them of that definition. So try those out with some of your students. Again, the activities, the videos, and the research on wordgeneration.org is so powerful and I encourage every educator to go and spend some time so that we each become more equipped to work towards closing the vocabulary gap that exists based on socioeconomic status, based on uh, disability, and based on cultural and linguistic diversity. In summary, we talked about the myths earlier. I want you to remember those myths and how to counteract them in our practice.